Well, a very good evening to you. Let us begin our worship by reading from Isaiah chapter 6, a very famous part of the book of Isaiah and, of course, of the entire Bible. Isaiah chapter 6, with these wonderful words of Isaiah's vision of the Lord. Let me just read this to you. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of of his glory and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke and I said woe is me for I am lost for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And whom will I go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Here I am, send me. Well, what a wonderful vision, what a terrifying vision that Isaiah had. He had that wonderful vision of God, the one who is high and lifted up. And it's, it's, it's stamped on his consciousness. He's aware of the reality of his sin, and yet with this burning coal that's taken with these tongs from the altar, he is also receiving of God's grace. And then there's this wonderful words at the end that are a challenge to us as Christians, aren't they? Here I am, send me. He, he wants to go out and to be active uh, for the Lord. And here's my question to you, and we're, we're confronted with this vision that, that fills this temple, this cascade of light that Isaiah had seen. I want to ask you, have you seen the Lord high and lifted up? Not in a vision quite like this, but have you realised that there is a covenant God that we worship? Have your eyes seen the King? For this evening, it is to King Jesus that we worship, that we worship. And to that end, let's begin with our first hymn that I will read through to you. Our first hymn that you, we will read through to you, which is from number uh, 47 in New Christian Hymns. And it will come up on the screen in front of you too. Number 47. Let me just read these words to you that paraphrase the wonderful vision that Isaiah has in chapter 6. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, God from of old, who evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 
Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Well, we are continuing our studies in Nehemiah, and we're going to turn to Nehemiah now before we pray. So we want to pray that we hear what God's word has to say to us and pray for his help. Let me turn now to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 5. Or rather, we'll take it up from verse 4, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. So, we're concentrating on verses 5 to 11 of Nehemiah chapter 1. It's page 548 in the Church Bible, if for some reason you have one in front of you. But we're going to take it up just from verse 4, because the other verses we've already considered. Let's hear what the Word of God has to say to us then this evening. So it was when I heard these words, this is Nehemiah speaking, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there, and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, and to the prayer of your servant who desire to fear your name, and let your servant prosper this day, I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cup bearer. For may God bless that word to us from Nehemiah. And in a few moments, we will consider what he has to say to us. Well, now it's time to come to pray. I want to pray really into the passage uh, that we have in front of us in Nehemiah and also that of Isaiah. We want to pray to a, a glorious and awesome God. We need to confess our sins to him, that we are aware of our reality of sin, that we that our need to be forgiven. I also want us to pray that the gospel will go forth in power this evening, that he will help me to preach these words and that we will see Jesus in this prayer um, of Nehemiah. No doubt there are um, many th other things that we can pray for that will occur uh, in the week ahead and have occurred by the time you, you hear this sermon and so no doubt you can pray for those silently too. So let's just come before the Lord in prayer. Father God we are reminded of those words in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah says I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Father God, you are a great and awesome God. You are our covenant triune God, Yahweh. Father, it is 
the most magnificent, it is the most majestic, it is, it is the most terrifying vision that Isaiah saw when he was in that temple. Father God, the, 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 the heavens declare your glory and majesty and Isaiah has been confronted with that. It is, it is no wonder that he falls to his knees and says, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips. Father, may we have the vision of this of splendour that we see before us in, in the word of God. May that be, may your majesty be at the heart of our understanding and our worship of God and who he is. May that vision of God be govern our everyday lives in private and in public. May it shape our public worship as a church this evening and indeed may it shape us as our private worship as, as individual believers for you know, worship is not something that is just sung it is not just something that we carry out in church it is everyday life 24 7 and may that vision of God inform our 24 7 hour week day uh, lives Father God, like that of Isaiah, we come before you and confronted by a holy, holy, holy God, thrice holy God. We are aware of our sin. We are aware of how God, how good you are, God, but how bad we are uh, as your people. And Father God, we know that sin can be a painful burden to us. Father God, we, we, we ask for your forgiveness when we arrogantly dismiss our sins as respectable or uh, not that important. When we push them to the edge so we don't have to deal with them and mortify our flesh. Father God, forgive us when we, we compare those sins to other people and we say, Father God, we know we're sinners, but we're just not as bad as that person that's over there. We're not as bad as those criminals in prison. We're not as bad as that person over there. Father God, you know, that, that, that is just Pharisaism. And Father God, we pray that you will you know, help us to understand the reality of sin, that you will forgive us when we, uh, we, we complain that we are actually a little bit better off than others. Father God, pray that we will never forget that we come before you as broken sinners that we may never strut and, 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 and swagger uh, like those who we think are better because they, they don't know the doctrines of grace. And so, you know, they're a little bit worse off than us. Father God, we know we, we see pride all around us um, and we see our own pride, we see our own sinfulness when we are confronted by that glorious vision of God. And we know that sin has... has not only corrupted our heart, it's corrupted humanity, it's corrupted the world. And we know that the city of man that we go through has been corrupted by that sinfulness. So then on the one hand, the world we live in is a, is a beautiful world. You, you have created, you know, as we just said in, in Psalm 19, that the heavens declare the works of your hands. And we see in men and women and boys and girls that wonderful image of God. And yet... And yet it's a dark world and we, we, we need the light. Father God, we, we weep and mourn like Nehemiah has done at the state of the church, at our nation, at the crooked and perverse generation in which we live. We may weep and mourn at the state of our own lives. But Father God, remind us to be meek, remind us that we are to be poor in heart, Remind us to be humble when we are confronted by the reality of sin. But Father God, we thank you so much that into this dark world there came light. Father God, we thank you that like Isaiah, our sin has been atoned for. And Father God, remind us that there, we had no part in this. That it was all of God and nothing of man. We have done nothing but the payment has been made. Forgiveness has been given freely to us. And we are cleansed and God has done it all through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, remind us that God saves sinners. That's why we, we should not stand as if we're better than others. 
Father God, you know, we're better off because if we're saved, then we're saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's good news. Father God, we pray that we, we, we give thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is very God of God and light of light. Jesus, you have, you have come as a, uh, to this world as our saviour and as redeemer. We pray that the, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be known in the farthest parts of this world. And again, we pray for those who are not saved. They may be the children in our families. They may be the parents in our families. They may be our husband or our wife. They may be our grandparents, our colleagues, our friends, whoever it may well be. We, those who are the Christless feet that we see walking up and down through our hometowns. Father, we pray that they will see in need of their Saviour. That they will see what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. That they will see Jesus not just as a, uh, as a, a nice man and as, a, as a, a teacher of wisdom. But they will see him as the Messiah. That they will see him as the risen Lord who, who had took on flesh. Lived a perfect sinless life, died and rose, ascended, and is, it reigns on high. Father, Jesus, we, we thank you for your Son. Thank you to the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that, that in him is our everlasting strength, that in him is the unsearchable riches for the needy, that in him there are treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and that there is fullness of the empty, and there are Many, many empty people there, that souls, unnumbered souls, on their way to hell. We pray that they will see their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray you give us the strength to proclaim that. Father, we pray your Holy Spirit to work afresh in this land once again. Father, there are so many people that are in great danger. We pray that once again our nation will become a, 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 a major uh, in, nation that will spread the cause of your gospel across this world once again. May this vision of God like the one in Isaiah and the prayer of Nehemiah that we're going to look at, may it help us, for we are just strangers in a strange land. We're just pilgrims. Help us not to forget this, to cling on to this, to cling on to the cross as we go through this barren land. Father God, it's going to be a long, hard journey through the city of man. But Father God, let us like that of a pilgrim in John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Take out those binoculars, those perspective glasses as they were called, and uh, look at that shaky image of the celestial city and know that that is where we are going. Let us show the, the grace of God in our lives. Let us be gracious men and women and boys and girls that we know our sin, but let us show that grace that God has given us to, into our, our ordinary lives. Father God, we can pray just like Nehemiah does, that may God give us the success. Because all the success we have in the Christian lives, uh, in our Christian lives, is down to our Father God and his sovereign action in this world. The work of his Holy Spirit in his hands. We thank you for the provision of your word that's in front of us. It's a, a lamp unto our feet, is it not, Father God? Your word has revealed to us what a majestic, splendid God you are. It speaks of your great redemptive plan to send the Lord Jesus Christ, to gather up a, a people to yourselves, to renew creation so that we can be in your presence in the new heavens and the new earth. Help us now to understand what's in front of us in Nehemiah's prayer, to concentrate, to see with the eyes of faith that teach us, Lord, yeah, teach us that we see in this passage, not just Nehemiah, but the God of the Bible. And most of all, that they... That we hear not my words, but we hear the words of Jesus speaking out this. All inspired scripture is the word of Jesus. And Father God, we pray that you will help us to see Jesus behind these words. Help us, help us, and may your word be food for our souls in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's come before... Uh, the word once again and see what it has to teach us and then we will finish with one final hymn which will be about prayer so back to nehemiah chapter 1 and verses 5 
to 11. When we started this service, we saw that vision of Isaiah confronted by an awesome God. And it's my belief that God's people need to have that vision of a mighty, majestic God, high and lifted up. One that has filled the temple in Isaiah's day. We need to have that vision as we build God's kingdom. And, and having such a vision was one of the great characteristics of the man that we've been looking at really in the last couple of weeks, particularly uh, two weeks ago, and that is Nehemiah. Nehemiah's vision of God is the very ground of his godliness, his very walk with God. He's going to be setting out in a, on a long journey soon. He's going to be directing the efforts to rebuild the city walls. He's going to be faced with all sorts of pressures from inside and out. He's going to be faced with opposition. He's going to be faced with folks that don't want to be involved in the work. He's going to return and find that actually things have returned to the way they were even before the people of God were exiled to Babylon. And yet he never loses his vision of God. And we shall see that right the way through the book of Nehemiah. And it's particularly the case in the chapter that's in front of us and this, this wonderful classic prayer that's in front of us. Now in his book, uh, The Looks at Nehemiah, uh, Jim Packer says it all really about Nehemiah. He says that Nehemiah is saturated with his praying and the praying of the truest and purest kind. Packer goes on to say, namely the sort of praying that is always seeking to clarify a vision of who and what God is. And to celebrate his reality, that is God's reality, in constant adoration. To rethink his presence, such needs and requests, or to rethink in his presence, such needs and requests as one is bringing to him. So this prayer is what we're going to consider just for the next half an hour. It's a solemn invocation of, of God's majesty. It's, it's, it's also a frank admission of Nehemiah and his people's sins. It, it appeals to the promises of a covenant God. And last of all, it, it sets a scene for when Nehemiah is ready for action. And it says there, give God, give, may God give me success on that day when I have to approach the king. I am the cupbearer. So we're going to have a look at one of these, these great, uh, this classic prayer that's there. Now, just a, a very, very brief recap as to how we got there. We looked at three things last week or the week before, I think it was, the restoration of the city, when we looked at the image of the city, that there is a city of man and there is a city of God. And in some respects, Jerusalem is the city of God. And yet that looks towards it, the fulfilment of the idea of the city of God. First of all, in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, in the city of Jerusalem that we read of in the book of Revelation. Secondly, we looked at the raising of God's servant, that God raises servants up in his providence for his cause um, and kingdom, men and women and boys and girls. And his purposes aren't hindered by the wicked. And these, these servants are found at the high end of society. So they can be like prime ministers and governors. Uh, they can be men that he's raised out of or well, completely out of pagan backgrounds like Abraham for example they could be unknown or from unknown or obscure backgrounds like an Elijah or, or most of, of the prophets and, and we said you know that us as Christians you know sometimes we are generals sometimes we are foot soldiers but either way God raises up men women and boys and girls for his purposes and then we looked at the, the response, though, of God's servant, that he weeps 
um, and that he mourns and then he prays. And Nehemiah's soul is it's, it's, it's deeply torn. And we have to remember that the Christian faith is not just one of assenting to truth statements, so, uh, uh, propositions, for example, but it's, it is effectual, affectional, you know. It's not just our mind that's changed, our whole being is changed. And his soul is, is torn. And, and we, we need to pray that just as Nehemiah weeps uh, and just as, uh, just as, as Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, that we need to pray that we have a heart uh, like our Saviour. Give us a heart to feel like him, that we will be moved, that there are those that, who are on their way to hell to be moved by the state of the church. So those were the three headings a couple of weeks ago. Uh, restoration of the city, the raising of God's servant, and the response of God's servant. So let's turn to the prayer between verses 5 and 11 that's in front of me here. And we're going to begin with that vision of God. So the first heading is this. Concentration upon God. Concentration upon God. The next heading will be that confession of sin. The confession of sin. Thirdly, we're going to look at claiming the promises. Claiming the promises. And last of all, commitment to action. Commitment to action. So first of all, concentration upon God. Now, Nehemiah has drawn near to God. And as he draws near to God, he, he reminds himself of God's greatness and of his grace. And our argument here, our premise here, is really that the, the character of God is necessary, is a necessary basis for prayer. So this prayer is a response to the news that he has heard. And he, he lifts his heart up to pray uh, for God's cause uh, and kingdom in this world. And this is what he prays uh, in verse 5. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So rather than a sudden and pitying cry, Nehemiah's prayer mounts uh, immediately to heaven, just as it does in the Lord's prayer. Um, and it's encouraging, as one commentator said, because... Uh, for it, the majesty that it shows puts man, whether it's Nehemiah's friend or foe, in its place. And this is a great and awesome God. Look where we are. And Nehemiah frequently uses terms like Lord God of heaven. Okay, he uses it in, in, in other places. By, by that he means, you know, it's self, God is self-sustaining. By that it means that God is self-energizing, that he's eternal. Elsewhere, Nehemiah talks about God being from everlasting to everlasting in chapter 9 and verse 5. In chapter 6 and verse 8, he, again, he calls God great. We sing great and awesome here. Uh, and so on and so forth. So Nehemiah has a very high view of God. He's a great and awesome God. This is, this is the God who has framed the universe. This is not some abstract attribute that he's given God. Nehemiah, is, he's encouraging his heart. He's crying to God he's, to, to recover his cause. He's reminding himself of those things. He's reminding him of the same vision of God that Isaiah has in chapter 40, when he speaks of God uh, that before God, the kingdoms of the world are just like a drop in the bucket. He is saying that you, are God, are great and awesome. And he's, he's, he's not just assenting to it, he's praying it. He's searching his heart. And these attributes that are here, the great and awesomeness of God, are not just something that we should pay assent to, but we are to be encouraged by it. We are to, to, to suck the very marrow of these doctrines of the greatness of God, to, to feed ourselves with this teaching, the one who has framed the heavens, the great and awesome God. And this breeds encouragement to our hearts. 
when we seek his face for ourselves, when we, we seek his face for our families or our, our church or our nation, for the world, we are praying to the one who can do exceedingly abundantly all things. This is the same God that has confronted Isaiah, he's read in chapter 6, sitting on a high, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, the train of his robe fills the temple. It's an amazing sight. It's no wonder that he fills to the ground. So, in summary then, this is where Nehemiah is, is casting his anchor in God, in who God is, his, his greatness, his grace. He's encouraging himself to be, to be bold. And he's reminding him, himself and reminds us that God is not only a God who is great and awesome, but he is a covenant God. That, those words, Lord God, Lord in, in, in caps means Yahweh, the same covenant God who was confronted, who confronted Moses in Exodus. This is the covenant God to whom he prays. And he says there then, you know, to those who love him and keep his commandments, right at the end there of verse Five, you know that this 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 love comes with the responsibility of being his people, and, it, and as a result, not only is he referring really to the Exodus God, he's referring to the law of God that we are a covenant people that we are to obey his uh, laws. He's assuming, of course, that uh, that I that the God of the Bible is faithful. He is faithful. But he also recognises that covenant people have particular responsibilities. And that actually, we'll see in a moment, they have been unfaithful. So what can we learn from these things, other than what it says there in Nehemiah? Well, I think first of all, we pray, we, we need to start with God. Sometimes, and I'm guilty of this too, sometimes we, we, we rush in and... We give him our requests. And Nehemiah doesn't do that. And what Nehemiah does is he begins with worship. He doesn't think about himself at all. He thinks about God. He, like I said, he, he reminds himself and us about who God is and to whom he is speaking. And we need to remind ourselves of these Things, you know, we need to remind ourselves of the kind of God God is. What is true about him? What kind of God is he really? And everything else depends on that. So the crucial thing we need to ask ourselves when we begin is, to whom are we praying? Now I think if we forget these things, maybe our prayers are all the more weaker. Okay, all the more weaker. But we need to really start with God, if we if we need the help that we that we that we we want, we're going to ask these questions. You know, who can help us, and will they help us? And we say that don't we about people that we know. Take our car into the, the the garage, and we might say, "Can you help us? Will you help us?" But when we pray to God, it, it's different because we know that God can help us. We know that God will help us. And so we need to begin with this great and awesome God. We need to remind ourselves of his strength and his wisdom, that he is a God that made the heavens and the earth, that he is thrice holy God. So we need to pray to uh, God to begin with. Pray to the, uh, an almighty, loving God. So remember these things. And it's difficult sometimes. We're overwhelmed at times with stress and and our anxiety but begin with God and secondly we need to consider who he is this is the covenant God he is self-existent he is transcendent he is above all he is utterly independent of us he is predicated of nothing he is eternal he is unchanging he's great also he's created the very world that we live in so we need to remind ourselves that the character of God, who he is, it is foundational for prayer. So remember these things. Consider him. Consider his name. 
Consider who God really is and begin by praising with God. And I think one of the lessons we learn from that is that when, when and throughout the book of Nehemiah is that constant private conversation uh, that he has with God is one of asking but also adoring. And that should be a, 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 that really should be a natural expression of us as a regenerate people. It's a, a discipline that we need to have, whether we're leaders, uh, whether we are the led, as it were, in church. And this example in Nehemiah should be indelibly etched uh, on all our minds. So concentration on God. And secondly, we have confession of sin. And like I said at the very start uh, of this, we have a frank admission of people's sins, a confession of sin. He says there in verses 6 and 7, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open, okay, to hear the prayer of your servant, confessing the sin to the people of Israel, he goes on, which we, okay, not I or them, but we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned against you, God. Verse 7, we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. So here then, linked with the concentration of God uh, upon a covenant God, there is this verse here or two, verses six and seven, that say, you know, we have been unfaithful as your covenant people. We have committed spiritual adultery. We are corrupt. We've, we've worshipped idols just like the pagans. We've, we've whored after other gods. And this was the experience, wasn't it? That's the reason why they were exiled all those decades before. The prophets had been sent to warn them, turn back to the covenant, go back to the covenant of God, look how you oppress one another. And they had covenant curse, I've got a covenant curse, they've been warned and warned and warned, and then eventually they are exiled. But now, through God's grace, they've been restored. And Nehemiah reminds himself when he speaks to God that he and his people have acted very corruptly against the God of the covenant and it's important you know Nehemiah is committed to God's cause and kingdom but he's also committed to his people he doesn't say I've you know it's not me it's them there's none of this they them accusation he identifies a hundred percent a hundred percent with his his people, the sons, sorry, the, the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned. I and my father's house have sinned. So Nehemiah doesn't just stand on the sidelines and say, "Look how sinful those people have been." You know, he doesn't just bewail the church and its sins. He says, "I am the problem. It's me." Okay, I, Lord, I cannot distance myself from these people. I've, I'm also guilty of these things. So there's no clinical observation. There's no remote looking on from distance. It is he identifying himself he, with his people. He stands in covenant solidarity with them. So it's no, there's no pious performance here. He stands in solidarity with a, a wayward disobedient and wicked people and that's important because he's well aware of course that that there, there, is, there is restoration has come but he has this sense of sin confesses it in our prayer in his prayers you know what he reminds himself and his people of and it should be a reminder to us of our covenant responsibilities Okay. God's greatness and grace is seen in his love, but there are covenant responsibilities to this. You know, it's all very well being Christians to say, well, I'm not responsible for that decline. Well, if you're not going to be responsible for the decline, nor can we be responsible for its recovery. It's both or neither. So we need to say that we ourselves have not been the people, Lord, that you want us to be. Nehemiah says it's my fault. We need to say that I am the problem. I am also going to be the builder that's been going to go on the walls and rebuild the city walls. 
We have to be reminded of what Jesus says. You know, if you love me, you keep my commandments. There's another thing as well here. Not only are we reminded of our covenant responsibilities, but look where Nehemiah places humanity in relation to the glorious God. What we might say in academia is anthropology, the study of man. You know, what is going on here is what, what commentators have called in the past worm theology. Recognising that he's in the midst of a wicked people and that he himself is the problems. And the fact is a lot of Christians, whatever confession they believe or follow, if they follow anyone at all, don't like to think about those things. They like to believe the hype in the world, that they can make themselves great. They believe in the, the, the therapeutic culture that we are in, that we, that, you know, well-mindedness, which I think in one sense is quite important, but well-mindedness is, is almost as good as salvation. And that somehow we are better than we really are. But we need to be reminded that spiritually speaking, we need to be reminded of this worm theology. That yes, we, we live in the joy of the Lord. Yes, we should rejoice in Christ. But I myself am thankful for the reminder that there is a, a God in heaven that says, Fear not, O Jacob, I will help. He will see me for what I am. So for when we come to Christ and go on in Christ... We discover that sin is a reality in our lives. It's a daily reality. There is, there's a daily mortifying of those sins. There's that daily pressing on. And as we go through the Christian life, we become more conscious of it. Now, I'm not saying that we should be some Uriah Heap character. You know, Uriah Heap's a character in, in uh, Mr. Copperfield, David Copperfield, uh, by Charles Dickens. And Uriah Heep always talks about humbleness. I am very humble at the moment, Mr. Copperfield. I'm a very humble person. But what we should do is we should not lose sight of the reality of sin. Yes, we see ourselves, you know, stand before the cross of Christ and see ourselves as God's people that we are. But we have to remind ourselves that we are uh, uh, that the robe of righteousness covers us perfectly. Uh, I remember one uh, minister in a sermon, I think it was on this passage, talking about his former minister, a man called William Still, very famous Scots Christian, um, who prayed once, Lord, let us be worms, but let us be glow worms. And that's the balance. The reality of sin, but also the joy of the Lord. Let's not have any of that false humbleness, but recognise our humility in, in the, the face of a covenant God. And as you're not, if you're listening to this uh, this evening or whenever it might well be on a CD or, <clears throat> excuse me, many, many months after I've preached this, the same is for you. If you're not a Christian, then you are a sinner. The world may not tell you that. The world may tell you that you're a good citizen of the city of man, and you probably are. No doubt you are a better citizen of it than me. But the Bible tells you that you are also a sinner. And you need Jesus. Now, if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, all the world's problems, all the life's problems don't disappear. It's not like therapy in that respect. But the big problem will be gone and dealt with, should I say. It will be dealt with, and that's the problem uh, of sin. You need to be saved. You need to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the God of the Bible is a just judge. And that means a judgment day. We all face judgment. And if you stand before him, what will you say? Well, I was a good citizen of the UK or whatever country it is you come from. Or will you stand before him and acknowledge that that robe you wear is the Lord Jesus Christ? And just a, a friendly reminder to you Christians as well, that when we remind ourselves of, of what worms we are, when we, when we come before him in prayer, we need to be reminded of that grace for us. If you struggle with these things, if you struggle with sinfulness, we all do. Of course, but if you are particularly struggling, if you're struggling with a particular sin, 
Or perhaps it might well be that uh, as you go through the life, you, you, you become aware also of how sinful others are around you. We need to be reminded of the grace that was given to us as believers and to be gracious men and women and boys and girls for Jesus. Uh, let us not be Christians who aren't gracious, even when we're defending the truth, even when we're advocating for the cause and kingdom of God. Let us be compassionate elders, deacons, ordinary church members. We need to ask ourselves, do we manifest the grace of God in our lives? Sometimes we quite flippantly say, there by the grace of God go I. But how true that is. Let us not, uh, as people of a particular confession of faith, not just talk about the orthodoxy, the right belief of grace, but demonstrate that grace to the unsaved and the saved who may not share our opinion. Thirdly then, not only do we have a concentration upon God, we have confession of sin. Thirdly, we have claiming God's promises. And here we got verses 8 and 9 and following. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the, the uttermost parts of heaven, or the, the farthest parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to that place I have chosen to make my name dwell there. So, so central to this prayer is the idea that God is a covenant God, his people are a covenant people. Um, and that covenant is what is given to um, Moses. So this framework informs Nehemiah's worldview. It informs his life, his, his prayers. The very language he uses is, is soaked in covenant imagery from the Torah, the first five books um, of uh, the Bible. He reminds them of those curses that if you are unfaithful you will be exiled and he also reminds them of the hope that if you return to me I will return to you and that's what we've been saying all along that Nehemiah has that that big picture of, of a God who promises that Nehemiah is along that storyline of exile and final uh, restorations and that uh, phrase there remember the word the word there in Hebrew is dabal, word or promise, which you commanded your servant Moses. So it's not just it's not the law so much, but the promise that you gave uh, Moses. And of course, Nehemiah pleads for these things. He claims the promises of God uh, in redemption. He uses the word there, you know, uh, as well. Uh, to, to redeem as well. You redeem the people from the uttermost parts um, of heaven, okay, from the furthest parts of the world. And it's a very similar appeal that Nehemiah, sorry, that, that, that Moses gives um, to God when he's interceding for the people on Mount Sinai after they built that wretched golden uh, calf. Uh, and I just want to ask before we move on to the final point, this is how many of us claim these sorts of promises from God? How many of you have claimed his promises for ourselves? And there are, are many of them. You know, uh, you, you know, when you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have claimed that promise that Jesus Christ has come to save you from your sins. You're, you're banking on it. You, you bank your whole life uh, upon it. You know, how many of us have, have really prayed that promise in Romans 8, 28 that's above my head here in the church? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Have you claimed that promise? Have you claimed the promise that God will forgive us and cleanse us of our sins? And if you are not saved, that's a promise for you. That you can come to Jesus and you can acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you wish to give your life to him. And that's the good news, the bad news that we said already, the judgment's going to come. 
Have you claimed the promise that you, that God, you will provide for all my needs according to the riches of your glory, in glory, in, in, in Jesus Christ? Have you claimed that promise to, to give us wisdom that we lack? You know, here is me, Lord. I, I lack a wisdom. You said you would give it abundantly. I'm asking. I'm asking. I, I'm claiming that promise. How many of you said, have, have, you know, you claim that promise that you have you keep your, your word for me? How many of you have prayed that promise that your grace will be sufficient and your strength will be perfected in my weakness? There's, there's lots of them. It reminded us, Paul has famously said in 1 Corinthians, you know, all promises in Christ are yea and amen to the glory of God. The life of faith is, is living by faith in God's promises. At the beginning of life, in the middle of your Christian life, at the end of the Christian life. You need to know God's word to rem- and so you can claim his promises. And that is what Nehemiah is doing. He's claiming promises. You said you would exile us. You have done. You have said you have restored us and you will do. I'm claiming that promise. I'm going to go out there and do your work claiming God's promises and last of all as we draw to a close as my time is up commitment to action how does he end his prayer in verse 11 he says this O Lord I pray please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man or it might be translated, give your servant success today. So what does he end this way? Why does he not pray for a mighty, mighty work of God, for the destruction of the enemies? You know, uh, is, is, is this all he will ask for? But you see, this is, I've heard it described as what Nehemiah is doing here is, is the needle point of personal commitment. He's committing himself to action. See, what he's saying in his prayer is that, um, God, give me success to your servant this day. When I go and speak to this man, in the sight of this man, it means art Xerxes. He's going to have to approach him, and we'll see another time. That could be a very dangerous thing um, to do. And Nehemiah is aware that he might be part of the answer in the prayer. His whole life is about to be changed because of something that God wants him to do. And over many, many months, we don't know how long we'll see later on, over four months, we don't know the reasons what went on in those four months. Eventually, he will come and have to say to the king, you know, uh, uh, you know please allow me to go back uh, to my homeland. So he's going to say, you know, here I am. I, 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 give me success. I'm here for this reason. I'm the king's cupbearer. I'm one of the few people that can approach the king directly. Please help me. We pray that God will be a success. And prayer is important because what Nehemiah does here is, in his prayer, is he, he puts himself into it. He's not saying that he can do it alone. He's saying he's part uh, of the answer and that he's got to speak to the man who, who will, in all likelihood, stop the work in the first place. But here, I think, just to finish off with, is the real pulse beat of Nehemiah's prayer, that he will make his name known, as it were, in the land, and that he will be committed to make that uh, a possibility through God's mighty uh, work. He wants God's name to be great among the nations, to be magnified uh, amongst them. Now, historically, of course, you know, the, the Christians aren't just those who are sent to these doctrines and devote their lives to, to prayer and worship and living Christian lives. But they always have that commitment to action to that zeal, that, that activism. It's that activism that led Carey to say very famously, or however, whatever form it takes, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And that's what Nehemiah's view you know, when you think about uh, other reformers like John Calvin, for example, he and his successor, a man called Theodore Beza, trained many, many men for the ministry at the Genevan Academy, where they would be pastors, trained as pastors, and go back to France, minister in great danger. And in a touching letter to these French Protestants, or Huguenots, they were called, John uh, Calvin wrote and encouraged them to send us wood. 
and we will send you arrows. And it would be a great blessing to the worldwide mission of the church. Now, we may not be in those circumstances, but God has got us great work to do. It may seem insignificant to us, but it will still require us to say, you know, God, give us success in that work. That's what we are called to do. And, and that's that vision of who God is, is what is behind that commitment to action. Again, one final illustration, the field preacher, a covenanter, a Scots covenanter called Donald Cargill, quite a famous man, was once criticised by another gospel minister who was a little bit more compromising in his belief than some of these covenanters who, who preached out in the open, hence why they were co- called field preachers. Uh, and the criticism went along these lines, you know, what's the need of all this concern about these things? In other words, uh, what, what Cargill is standing strong for? We will get to heaven and they will get no more. And it, it's something that people may often express. Do you think that the concern about what scripture says on this or, 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 or that subject is going to get you to heaven? Uh, when Cargill heard that remark, I think he might have been on his way to his execution, actually. He replied, yes, we will get more. We will get God glorified on earth, which is more than heaven. So Cargill or a Calvin or a Beza or a Nehemiah or an Amy Carmichael or whoever it might well be has that commitment to action. And so as we leave the city of man, on the way to the celestial city, as in Pilgrim's Progress. We need to have that concern for God's glory as we step out in uh, faith. We need to have that bigger picture. And we need to, as, as we are engaged in the great cause of God's kingdom, we need to keep hold of that ultimate destination. Amen. Well, we're just going to come... Uh, to the end now with one final hymn that I will read through. Or by all means, you can read through it with me if you so wish. If you have a New Christian Hymns book, uh, then it is 416, but the words will no doubt come up on the screen in front of you. James Montgomery's hymn on prayer, because it's, it's about teaching us to pray, which is what Nehemiah has been doing. Really, He's, he's teaching us to pray. So number 416, Lord, teach us how to pray aright with reverence and fear. Though dust and ashes in your sight, we may, we must draw near. We perish if we cease from prayer. Oh, grant us power to pray. And when to meet you, we prepare. Oh, meet us by the way. Burdened with guilt, convinced of sin, in weakness, want and woe. Fightings without and fear within, Lord, whither shall we go? God of all grace, we come to you with broken, contrite hearts. Give what your eye delights to view, truth in the inward parts. Give deep humility, the sense of godly sorrow. Give a strong, desiring confidence to hear your voice and live. Faith in in the only sacrifice that can for sin atone, to cast our hopes, to fix our eyes on Christ, on Christ alone. Patience to watch and wait and weep, though mercy long delay, courage our fainting souls to keep and trust you, though you slay. Give these and then your will be done, Thus strengthened with your might, we by your spirit and your son shall pray and pray aright. I like that particular verse that is there. Patience to watch and wait and weep, though mercy long delay. Courage of our fainting souls to keep and trust you, though you slay. So let's keep hold of that ultimate destination as we travel through the city of man as pilgrims and look forward to a greater city that is to come. Let me just read this short benediction from Romans 15 and verses 5 and 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, 
in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.